The first time I tried mushrooms going into the Great Pyramid was a very microdose, and I wanted to see what I would experience in there. I'm now convinced that the Great Pyramid is intended to be used with mushrooms or blue lotus psychedelic. Why? Welcome to the multiverse, where we believe that mushrooms can actually change the world. And that if humans mirrored the magic and wisdom of the fungi kingdom, we would have a far more joyous and connected planet. Each week, we'll be meeting with thought leaders and experts to extract the best insights and stories across everything from functional fungi, psychedelic medicine, and so much more. Thanks for listening. Step into the multiverse with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Into the Multiverse. I'm really excited for this episode. It actually took us a while to start recording it because we sat down and started talking about so many funny things, um, which sparked a whole nother direction of this conversation that I want to get into. But I am so excited to have Robert Edward Grant on the show today. Thank you for being on my couch. Good to be here. Um, I was stalking you on the internet this morning, and I have a few things written down that I want to share to give a little context and color of who you are. So I'm going to read that first um, and then share a few highlights Mm -hmm. and then share a takeaway. And then I want to see what gaps you have to fill. Okay. We'll start that way. Um, But this is going to be a really fun episode. I hope we get into a lot of interesting elements. You're, um, you're one of the most unique resumes that we've had on this podcast, I would say. And I think people are really going to enjoy this episode. So for a little color on who you are, these are some things that I've pulled from the internet. You are an entrepreneur, You are a best-selling author, inventor, polymath, mathematician, visionary thinker, musician, music theorist, artist, sculptor, and author of several research and patent publications spanning biology, DNA combinators, number theory, geometry, and physics. And what you're most renowned for people that hear your name um, actually, one of my roommates was watching one of your shows the other mm-hmm. night, and I was like, "Hey, he's coming! He's coming over in a few days to record a show." Um, but sacred geometry is this term that most people know you for, and all of your work has had such profound implica- implications on mathematics and the simplified way of what I, you know, kind of can um, round out your work to be is the intersection of of science and spirituality. Mm-hmm. A few highlights that I wanted to read. Okay. which I thought were really funny because I don't know what any of them mean. Um, you are, you discovered the A Q in the Bre- in the great pyramid. I want to know what Alpha that is. Omega. Alpha Omega. Oh, okay. I think I wrote that one down wrong. <laughs> Alpha Omega. Um, you are the founder of infinite and accurate prime number prediction discovery. Mm-hmm. And the right triangle is the unity principle of one thought. I think that that gives like an overview of how complex your work is. Um, but what I would love to start with is what would you describe your work and mission in the world if you had to like really share it? These are all like incredible, very intelligent sounding sound bites. But how would you simplify your work for someone who is like has no idea about anything that I just shared? Um, I would say that my purpose for being here is to learn how to love and how to be loved in a large heading kind of overarching theme. That's the most important thing. I think we're all here to learn how to love and how to be loved. That's it. Can we receive love? Can we love ourselves? Can we empathize with all the other different points of perspective and realize that the only way to come to an objective truth is by accumulating the sum of all of the possible infinite, almost absolutely infinite, subjective perspectives of what truth might be for each individual viewer. So there's never been another Ali like you. There will never be another one like you. And there's never been Robert Grant before, and there'll never be another like me. Even my other incarnations through time are not the same as me right now, because right now I have all the unique conditioning biases. I have all the unique traumas. I have all the unique experiences that have led me to see the world not as it is, but as I am. And realizing that means that the only way for me to be able to expand my consciousness would be to try to accumulate as many other perspectives as possible. And that's why I love geometry so much, because geometry expands your way of perceiving the world around you. It expands your perspectives. It forces you to see things differently, and it acts like a QR code for your subconscious mind. 
It awakens you without you even knowing it. All is happening at a subtle level. And, um, and I'd say that's probably an encapsulation of what I feel my mission is here uh, and why I'm here today with you and also why I am you know, living when I'm in this interesting point in time in the human story. So what you just described, you know, is maybe different from people that heard that description of you, that, you know, that bio Mm -hmm. sounds more science-based, sacred geometry, polymath. It sounds um, very math, you know, mathematical and and science-based. And then when you share your mission is to love and be loved, it sounds more on the spiritual side of things. And so um, I'd love you to share like a few kind of highlight points of your journey mm-hmm. of like what has landed you here. And there's obviously so much, and that could be 12 podcasts in and of itself, but through the lens more so of your journey from your head to your heart. I actually asked our, our mutual friend, Emily Fletcher, I was like, yo, Robert's coming on the show. He's amazing. Based on your podcast, what do you think I should talk to him about? And um, we obviously want to, I want to talk about mushrooms and psychedelics, mm-hmm. hence the theme of the show. And one of the things she she prompted me to ask you was about the journey from your head to your heart. And it sounds mm. like maybe your journey has led you starting more in the head. Oh, it definitely started heart. in the head. Um, and I, I think that that was the major shift for me. I was always very logos oriented. So I had to have a material, I'm a Taurus, and I had to have a material grounded viewpoint on what reality is and was. So I was always interested in physics and biology and chemistry and understanding the building blocks of nature. But when you actually start to experience crisis and the world is not as you expected it to be, then it caused me in 2016 to really, instead of like I would have normally done, you know, we all kind of experience the world. We think, oh, that happened to me, that sucked or somebody did something to me and I was a victim for this or that. And at some point, our own narcissism, which I don't see as a bad thing, right? Narcissism is when you decide you want to be something and you only are able to see the aspects of yourself that are pleasing to you, pleasing Mm -hmm. to the eye. So the eye and the way our mind thinks tricks us and it blocks from us our ability to see the truth of us. We don't have eyes in the back of our head. So we can only see 180 degrees. We can't see more than 180 degrees of ourself. So that's why it's so valuable to do in the corporate setting, a 360 degree review on people. And that helps them bring their awareness up to what they truly are versus what they believe they are. And if there's a, a big gap between what they truly are, and how their peers perceive them versus how they perceive themselves, then those gaps have to be reconciled eventually. They absolutely have to be reconciled. And that's a function of self-awareness. And the, the less self-aware you are, the stronger your denial reflex is of the shadow aspects of yourself. So you can't see the shadow aspects of yourself. Why? Because an eye can't see itself without the aid of a mirror. Because a tooth can't bite itself. Because fire can't burn itself. Because a knife can't cut itself. Mm. The nature of consciousness is that each and every one of us have to learn how to go outside of our normal perspectives to be able to see a different viewpoint, a different viewpoint on ourself. And and I think that is such a valuable aspect of the ascension journey. Uh, I really do. And so for me, I had a crisis in 2016 and it was a crisis where it was work oriented. I almost lost my companies that I'd founded and everything and it was close. I had a VC battle that was like horrifically bad and difficult. And they tried to get control of the company and kind of pull a fast one. I won. I mean, it came down to it. I had to raise $55 million in one day. And otherwise, I'm going to lose control of the company. And somehow, and it was a very limited number of people I could even go to because the VCs were exercising their right to block new investors and everything. They were really trying. they, They thought they had me dead to rights. I thought they did too. And then somehow I threw an end zone pass from one end zone to the other and then ran and caught it at the same time. And I ended up pulling a rabbit out of my backside. And I didn't lose the company. I didn't lose control. I I kept it all. And yet I felt like I lost the war. Because in the process of it, which was a long, drawn-out, cathartic marathon of a run that literally took me down to my knees, I lost a lot of people I thought were friends. Mm -hmm. 
And these are people that I'd worked with over many years. You know, I was a, a big pharma president, CEO before that, um, before I started my own group of companies. And then my companies started, they all took off. They did really well. And what happened was people got kind of greedy. The VCs got greedy. They wanted to, and I, I was launching a new product that was, I was responsible when I worked at Allergan, I was responsible for launching Juvederm, Lapband, Latisse, all these products that became big, Botox Cosmetic, and Allergan's a big pharma company. So I kind of, that was one of my big claims to fame. It's funny that my early career was focused on two areas, really, three. I was in cardiology, I was in ophthalmology, the eye, and I was in aesthetic medicine. And I became like the leader of the whole aesthetic medicine industry. Hmm. Which is kind of funny because here I am learning aesthetics and this completely different aspect of the self, right? Looking at it from an outside in perspective rather than an inside out perspective. Hmm. And I was learning the hallmarks of beauty, the golden ratio, all that stuff, you know, how much injection filler you put into the bottom lip versus the top lip and all that stuff mattered. And I made brands become like huge household names. I launched LASIK as well. I mean, there were all kinds of things that I was involved in in my early career that I had no clue how the dots connected to where I am today. And yet, for me now, sitting where I am on this couch with you, I can totally see why. You can't see how the dots connect, as Steve Jobs said in his speech at Stanford University at the commencement. I, you can't see how the dots connect sometimes very often until you can see them in the retrospect. And then all the dots, the constellations come together into this beautiful mosaic or tapestry of experience that you realize was all there to awaken you so that you could remember who you are and learn how to love and be loved. It's it's really that simple. And so when I went through that experience, um, it caused me, experiencing that extreme betrayal, caused me to go deeply inward. And instead of, and for the first time in my life, instead of saying it was someone else's fault, because I could easily say they left me down the river, you know, as they left a man down, how do you do that? And I was very much always very judgmental of that type of thing. You know, you never leave a man down. You never, I had a code that, that I lived by and I expected others to also live by that same code. And when, when the kitchen got hot, you know, some of these people that I thought would be there in the most difficult of circumstances ran out of the kitchen and even stabbed me in the back. And that was very painful for me. But instead of saying, this guy screwed me or this person did this to me or whatever, I looked at it entirely differently. And I said, why did I choose this? Hmm. What about this circumstance? What about this learning was so important for me to experience? Because I'd already started to realize the role that I played not as an actor on someone else's stage, but that somehow I was a script writer. I was also the director, producer, and, and you know the actor on the stage as well. So when I started realizing that I was all of those things, how could I blame somebody else? It wasn't someone else's fault. So what it caused me to do is it caused me to go inward and to question all of my objective reality. So in the process of questioning objective reality, the most objective of science is math. And so I I started with, does one plus one really equal two? You know, and why is one times one really one? And I literally questioned from first principle, every aspect of my objective realistic world. And in the process, I discovered several things along the way. And I found the nature of the universe and the language of the universe is mathematics. And that actually math without meaning is just information, but math with meaning can be divine communication from this higher providential power that somehow is this invisible hand that brings it all together and is also related to, some call it the oversoul or the higher self, but it could also be related directly to your unconscious and subconscious mind. Mm. So I started realizing that everything was patterned. It's just that our limit on being able to perceive those patterns is what we were calling entropy because it's random, but actually it's not necessarily random at all. It's only random to our perception. I mean, think of it like this. Let's say that 
you know, X thousands of years ago, because this is a subject of some debate, the, the wheel was not known. And how do you even make a wheel? Well, okay, is there a relationship between the diameter of a line, right? So a line as a diameter, then turn that into a circle. What's the relationship between the circumference versus the diameter, right? We know, of course, now that that's pi. You know, pi times the diameter equals the circumference. Easy, right? But for people that lived thousands of years ago, they might be like, well, how do I exactly measure this, right? To get this all the way around, and then, you know, it's not quite 3.14. It's got a little bit more on top of it than that. So maybe it's 3.14285714, which is 22 over 7. And that's a rough approximation for pi. And then that pushed the boundary of ignorance and entropy further out from humanity. So you could think of it as you've got this realm of you. Hmm. You know what you know, and you call that the conscious mind. Then there's a realm of you that you know you don't know, and you call that the subconscious mind. Then there's another realm of you that you don't even know that you don't know. It's outside of your comprehension, and we call that the unconscious mind. So what we're really doing is we're all, as we grow and learn, we're pushing the boundary on our consciousness. Farther, it's expanding farther and farther out mm -hmm. so that the zone of I don't know what I don't know is getting pushed farther and farther out. Right? You're not an expert maybe in something like, do you know how to ice skate very well? Can you ice skate? No, but I love that it was a consideration that I was a good ice skater. But you know that you don't know ice skating. And you know that there are people that know ice skating, right? For sure. So that would be in this zone of you know that you don't know it. Mm -hmm. The things that you know that you know is you know mushrooms. You probably know mushrooms better than anybody or one of the, you're one of the experts in the field. And so in that realm, you've got a very high degree of consciousness. And what until you learned that, it might have been completely unpatterned. You just didn't perceive the pattern. Hmm. So it's the same thing with math. So it starts off with 22 over 7. Well, then a few thousand years later, someone else comes up. You know, it's Archimedes who comes with that. And then someone else comes up and, and says, well, actually, a more accurate, you know, approximation for pi is 355 over 113, which comes out to 3.14159262. So you're getting closer and closer to this infinite irrational value that's perfected. Every time it seems like the... The zone beyond is the I don't know what I don't know is becoming more and more ordered and more and more patterned. It was always ordered. It was always patterned, just not in our perception. And so this is one of the things that I, I think is very powerful about psychedelics is that it has the impact of allowing you to perceive pattern in an accelerated way, right? And as you you know, experiment with psychedelics and, and mushroom journeys and ceremony, et cetera, then all of a sudden, you know, you can see the structure of the universe. And I don't believe that mushrooms give us a hallucination. I believe that mushrooms, you know, they don't give us a hallucination or an illusion. They reveal the illusion. They reveal the hallucination. It's the exact opposite. You follow what I'm saying? 100%. So, so basically, for me, I came at it and I found the divine through this very, very objective means. And, you know, I'm not the first to say this. I think it was Louis Pasteur, who's not popular on many levels because he pasteurized milk, but whatever. Let's go beyond that judgment for a moment and not discount what he also said, which is if you study a little science, it takes you further away from God. But if you study a lot of science, it takes you nearer to him or her. And, and I think that's exactly what I found, is that we often only go to a superficial level, superficial level of science, and therefore we miss all the patterns that reveal the divine in virtually everything, that everything is patterned. For even one pattern to exist in a sea of entropy implies that the entire sea is patterned. Hi guys, taking a brief second away from the show to tell you a little bit about our sponsor. Supermush is our brand inspired by the 60s and 70s that makes the most delicious and effective functional mushroom supplements. Our newest and best-selling products are sex, energy, and sleep gummies. 
They're sugar-free, they're delicious. And for listeners of this podcast, we have a special discount code for you. It's ITM15. And if you want to try our gummies, use ITM15 at checkout. You can find all these products at supermush.com. That is one of the most interesting framings I've ever heard, specifically as it relates to psychedelics, revealing the patterning of nature. Because when people, and I, you know, I want to, I want to dive into your own personal journey with psychedelics, but for people that are listening to this that maybe don't understand what we're talking about, you take um, any sort of psychedelic, just say psilocybin, for example, converts the psilocin in your brain. And what people experience is a lot of visuals where you're seeing certain things like fractals, sacred flower geometry, um, you know, the flower of life, like all these beautiful patterns. Um, you can see a lot of psychedelic artists that recreate these patterns, whether it be Alex and Allison Gray, um, that paint what these visuals look like inside of your brain. And so what I'm hearing you say that's really interesting is, well, number one, I completely agree. I believe, you know, psychedelics are actually opening your visual cortex. And so the kind of like nerdy science behind this is yeah. psilocin, psilocin opens your eyes. You're actually letting in more light and seeing more of the reality of what's there, AKA re revealing the illusion. But I've never thought about the fact that we all go in and learn, you know, I was in, I was really good at math when I was younger, like mm -hmm. advanced calculus, all the things, right? I took all those classes. Mm -hmm. I never saw any value in it. But the question now is more so like if people would take it further and actually then see like pushing the boundary of learning how all these patterns then apply to the world, that actually brings you closer to God. Because what I saw as valuable was really and spiritually, what I saw of, of its value spiritually was never related to math until I started to learn more things along the lines of, of sacred geometry. And so I love the kind of full circle of that because the question originally was what brings you, what has brought you more into your heart? And a lot of the things that we more so hear about with people getting into their heart, they usually don't start with math. But what you did is start with math and take it to the nth degree. We are able to actually see how it patterns and applies to all of nature and then realize that we are a reflection of nature. Is that a, is that a, Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny because people tend to think of math as being the most objective of the sciences, but, and the queen of the sciences mm. as it's called, but actually it's also the most esoteric. I'm doing a podcast tomorrow on my podcast with uh, Caitlin Carehart, who is, you know, one of the top numerologists in, in the country, maybe even the world. And, it's the study of numerology. It's like it becomes kind of a hiss and a byword in the mathematics circles because people are like, oh, as soon as you start going into applying meaning to number, then it's numerology, hmm. right? And it's kind of a, it's made fun of. Even though numerology, anyone who's actually studied it, crazy accurate, even more so because the nuances in the number come out just the way that our numbering system is, come out so deliberately in the numerology easier than you can find it sometimes with having to figure out, okay, how does a Gemini moon and a Libra rising and a, you know, uh, um, um, a Venus and Aquarius all come together, right? Mm -hmm. what, that's like a mix of stuff mm -hmm. that only certain people can speak that language. But in the numerical aspect of it, it all gets derived down to a few numbers that are really just replacements for musical notes. And that we are looking at the geometry that's represented by that numerical exchange as being the music that we experience with our eyes. A question that comes up for me as I'm as I'm hearing you talk, and I kind of mentioned it because you were asking me what I did for my birthday to mm -hmm. celebrate my birthday over mm -hmm. the weekend. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. I just turned 30. It's way better than my 20s. I love it already. Um, but one of the one of the gifts, and it makes me it makes me emotional to to think about because it was truly the most beautiful gift that I've ever received. I had a large group of my friends coordinated by um, my closest best friends that put together this gift that they've been working on for the last few months. And what they did was um, my father passed away a little over a year ago. And so they worked with my mom to take pieces of his old clothing and mm -hmm. cut them up, sew them together and made me two pieces of like a beautiful, I mean, they look they're gorgeous, but like a jean jacket and a kimono out of his dress shirts. And they made a video of the experience of working with my mom and the whole, I mean, like documenting the whole process. And it was 
it was so overwhelming to receive because of obviously so there's so much emotion there and you're getting to wear the mm -hmm. energy. Um, I swear this comes full circle to my question, but it was the most creative display of love that I've that I've been the recipient of. Wow. And it was so inspiring for me. And it was so, I mean, I I like bawled my eyes out and um it was it was so special. But what it inspired in me was just thinking about like how creativity and love, like this is now my most prized possession. And I have such a reverence for that process that it makes me want to do that for other people. And as I was thinking about and reading about a lot of your work, it's very, it feels very split. You know, even when I read your intro, it's like mathematician, polymath, all of that. Here's all your like science awards, which are so incredible. But then you have sculptor, artist, you know, you are very much in the arts. And so my question to you is, and I, I wrote it down because I, I, I'm not <coughs> exactly sure how to word it, but the question is really like, what is happening in the body when we combine creativity and love? Because what you described as your mission is to find out how to like love and be loved through, it sounds like a path, a path mm -hmm. of like mathematical mm -hmm. approach. Um, and creativity often can be, I guess, mathematical and calculated, but I'm just, I'm just curious what your, your thoughts are on that. Well, I would say um, I, I came across someone who informed me of a word that they had created that I thought really made sense to me <laughs> that described exactly what you're we talking about. We talk about like left, right brain hemisynchronization, right? And how that is something we should aspire to, whether you- And for people that don't know what that means, it's asking, basically asking for a friend. Your left, brain, your left <laughs> brain is the seat of your rational thought. Your right brain is the seat of your irrational. Your creative, thought, your creative brain. Your creative brain, right? It's the dark aspect. It's the feminine, which is the right brain. And this is assuming you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, our right eye connects to our left brain through the optic nerve that crosses the optic chiasm at the pituitary gland mm -hmm. inside our brains. And the other eye, the left eye, connects to the right brain. So you have the, the right eye in Egyptian kind of mythology of the right eye of Horus and you have, or sorry, the right eye of Ra and the left eye of Horus. And so the left eye of Horus represents the moon. It represents intuition. It represents, and it's connecting to your right brain, right? So it's your ability to see the intuitive, creative aspects, the irrational part. So if we look at the brain, actually, from the standpoint of the you know right temporal lobe is the seat of how we process music. The left temporal lobe, so in the exact same spot, but just on the other side of the brain, is the place we process mathematics. And the center of our brain is where we process geometry. So that's why it's so powerful to the awakening process because geometry and language, and I also learned several languages during my lifetime. I always saw myself as a linguist in a way. And so when you can turn on that center part of your brain, you're very close already to turn on, turning on your pineal and your pituitary glands, right? So that's why geometry is so powerful. But you've got a left brain representation, which is number and ratio, and you've got a right brain rep representation, which is music. The same thing with the visual cortex. In the back of the brain, occipital lobes, right? You've got the, on the right brain, you've got the visual arts, Right, and then how those visual arts manifest into the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. So you could say that the natural sciences around us are just a representation of an incredible piece of God's artwork, right? And mm -hmm. the two things are inextricably connected. And then along that journey, you could say, well, where's architecture? Architecture is somewhere between geometry and maybe sculpture. So you could literally create a geometric form by looking at a cross section from the top view of a brain. And what this does when you connect the head with the heart through the throat chakra in particular, it's the bridge that connects the two, then what you achieve is something that my friend um, basically told me is ambliception. So ambliception. And that's the intersection of using the right brain and the left brain. Yeah, it's like being able to perceive from both brains, from both eyes. And this is exactly what the Egyptian mythology is trying to point us to, which is they always talk about the missing left eye of Horus. He lost his eye in a battle with his uncle to avenge his father's death. So he left his, he lost his ability to intuitively perceive. 
So the way you have to learn it is by falling in love with the divine feminine hmm. and integrating the divine feminine learnings so that you can have the left eye of intuition as a man. And by the same token, the feminine ends up having to fall in love with the rational, responsible aspects of the masculine. You know, going back to the discussion about having a headboard, right? <laughs> And, and what con- that means, we yeah, can go back into yeah, let's that. Let's give the context. But, um, <laughs> but basically, that rational, structured, masculine thing is something that society also craves. So the two need each other, just as light craves darkness, mm. seeks the darkness, and darkness seeks the light. The two need to coexist with each other. And we think that, that darkness somehow is the absence of light. I, I don't believe that. I reject that categorically. Darkness is the opposite condition of light. Just as a color that it has an opposite color on the spectrum is its absorbed color, you have a reflected color. You know, this couch is not really this kind of tealish color, right? It's only the reflectant, a reflection of that color. The actual color is closer to what you're seeing in these colors. That's why the, they match together well. They're actually the same color because one is just reflecting, the other is just absorbing. Hmm. Right, It's almost like a palish yellow that would be the opposite of, of this color, right? So as you think this through, you start realizing, okay, well, maybe we're here just to learn all these different perspectives and perceptions so that we can learn how to love and we can learn how to receive love. And the means to doing that, most importantly, is going to be through the study of the opposite sex. So then the divine play begins, the drama of you know, this rhythmic balance interchange between the man and the woman. You know, it's like the, one of my favorite songs by uh, Peter Gabriel, The Blood of Eden, right? The man and the woman, the alchemical union. How does that union come together into this amblyceptual experience that allows you to, to see from both perspectives? So now, Integration of the divine feminine means that I can start looking at the world more from an intuitive standpoint, and then I can balance that intuition with the rational thought. And the two have to work together. It's very easy to fall into the belief that, okay, well, if we're only focused on the heart, then that's good. Actually, that's not good. It needs to be balanced between heart and brain. This is heart-brain coherence. And we often tend to think about you know, our brains as being hard drive storage units or something like that. But what if I said to you that really the way to achieve higher states of awareness and consciousness is by balancing our brains between the left and right aspects, right? The rational and the irrational. And once we do that, then our antenna is more perfectly tuned and titrated to the signal Hmm. that we want to basically learn from. And then in that context, our thoughts even local to our brain, maybe they're all just radio reception that we're picking up. And I tend to believe that our brains and our hearts in combination, because we actually have brain tissue also in our heart, right? Right by the SA node of the heart. There's also all kinds of neurons that bundle right in there to manage the electrical impulses that start at the top of the heart and then extend down to the bottom of the heart through the AV node or atrioventricular you know, node or junction as it's called, and then down through the left and right ventricles and then pumping the blood out and actually creating vortices of the blood. These things that are happening are really about achieving this awareness state that I think is encapsulated in one quote that I really love. When the heart thinks and the mind feels, that's when the river of wisdom flows. Hmm. The two have to come together in a symbiosis of empathy and awareness and understanding. The masculine has to appreciate and love the feminine in order for it to be superseded by the heart aspect, which, you know, and I I truly believe that by achieving this, then you can achieve a higher state of conscious awareness and enlightenment. And I think we can define that simply as when your expression of love supersedes your desire for one objective truth. In this case, the heart-led aspect of it doesn't 
overtake or beat down the brain aspect of it. But it has to be heart-led consciousness. So the heart has to be the thing that pulls you. It's the aspect of you that has to recognize logically that the pathos is going to be that true north. It's going to tell us where the true north actually is, but it's not greater than, right? It's equal. Mm -hmm. It's not greater than the logos. The logos has to be there. The logos must exist. And it has to equal, have, be an equal proportion to the pathos. And when those two things happen, then ambleception occurs Ambly, and wisdom. Ambleception. And wisdom emerges out of the consciousness. And this is wisdom is a, another word we, we use. You know, philo Sophia means a lover. Philo means lover. Sophia means wisdom. So the name of the goddess that's on the Michelangelo's, you know, Adam God painting on the Sistine Chapel. It's on the ceiling. And they've got the two fingers, you know, almost touching each other. Mm -hmm. That painting, you'll see God inside of it, kind of like his body is oriented exactly as a mirror reflection of Adam's. The orientation. It's a literal mirror reflection, just like the fingers pointing to each other are the mirror reflection. And when you also look closely at it, you'll notice there's a younger woman who is behind God, but under his arm also, kind of coming across in the form of an X. So her body is going one direction, his is going the other, and the two are meeting at the optic chiasm. That's ambleception. Yes, ambleception. True balanced ambleception is personified in Christ consciousness, which is the X. Hmm. The reason why we're seeing X everywhere and companies are changing their names to X and all this kind of stuff is because it's part <laughs> of the awareness. The awareness is that it's time to achieve ampliception. And and to me, that's a it's a very beautiful aspect that I think is super powerful. And I actually just had there's there's just so many different directions to go with everything that you just shared. I actually just had a really beautiful conversation on on Emily Fletcher's podcast about the intersection of the masculine and feminine and how we've kind of like overcorrected, or there's like an overcorrection right now that we're seeing to the feminine, and we're kind of like you know, losing the structure and the masculine that's needed to to bring those 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 places into balance. And um that is a whole other rabbit hole to go down. But what I would love to kind of take this mm -hmm. part of the conversation into is a lot of the things that you're describing are difficult for people um to grasp. And yet when they have some sort of a psychedelic like experience. And that doesn't necessarily only have to be through psychedelic. It could be breathwork meditation. The brain state is very similar, transcendental or, meditation. Or drawing geometry. Or drawing geometry, which is the thing you probably know most about mm -hmm. than any other person that's ever come on this podcast. If I want to hear more about it, but I would love to hear um specifically how psychedelics have been a part of grasping, whether it be this concept or other big ones in your life. You said, you know, before we started recording, it sounds like they're a new part of your journey. And I think it'd be so interesting for people to hear about when did they come into your field of awareness? Why did you decide to start working with plant medicines? Um, and what have they shown you about your life? I think they're an incredible teacher. Um, so for me, I, I was really late to the plant medicine aspect of this. I was already, you know, posting a lot of my geometric work. I started posting my geometric work, not because I wanted other people to experience, I'm trying to think about how to best phrase this. I felt I had to share. When you start realizing that you don't live in, in a universe, but you live in a you inverse, hmm. and that everything that is reflected in the world around you is simply a function of what is going on inside of you. And so if that's the case, so all the things and judgments I don't like about myself start showing up in the world around me as things that I get triggered by because I'm actually that thing. And my subconscious mind is wanting to remind me it's not separate from you. The things that you don't like about other people, the old saying does apply. If you spot it and judge it in someone else, you are that thing. You simply can't see it in yourself. I always remind myself of that when I see someone or if I feel an annoyed feeling, I'm like, oh, she's this is just you in a different, in a different light. And if 
if anyone has ever said, you know, or, or know about the concept of we are all one and that, you know, scientific evidence proves that we are one consciousness experience through different perspectives. It's so difficult to remember when your mom annoys you. It is just, it's you talking to you. You know, and, and how many times have we seen this, right? It's like when, when someone will often complain about their mother or their father and how they act a certain way, and they're the only ones that are unable to see that they are acting the same way that they're complaining about. Yep. It happens all the time. It's like he who smelt it dealt it, right? It's, yep. it's the, if you spot it, that means you got it. We continue to attract everything that we judge until we no longer judge everything we attracted. Wow. Which is like, whoa, damn. That's like a penetrating concept that you start to really realize and say, so wait, that means, as Carl Jung actually does say, every annoyance and every trigger is an opportunity for us to get to know ourselves better. So the things that I don't like about other people are really just aspects that I don't like or I'm tempted by or I judge in others. You know, I remember I did a podcast with uh, uh, Kelly Brogan. And Kelly told this awesome story. She's amazing, by the way. I, I really think highly of her. And she told this awesome story about how she was so outspoken during COVID. She was listed as the, you know, the top 12 disinformation divas type of thing. You know, she's like the, dis the she was part of the disinformation dozen on COVID and the vaccine. And, and she loved it. She reveled in it because she's a total rebel. You know, she went to Cornell University for med school and she's had a practice in New York City. And she's a, this amazing woman that's powerful. And she decided that she wanted to join this like Christian app group. So I'm like, okay, this is, I've got to listen to this story. And she tells the story how they sent her letter and said, uh, you know, probably by email, but said, you, you can't be in this chat group anymore, right, on this app. And she's like mortified. She's mortified. No one's going to tell me I can't do something. So she was ready to write this whole feminist, you know, vitriolic retort. And she never did. I mean, she, she calmed it down. She didn't write it to that degree, but she did write a retort. And and she actually understood and empathized with her position, but she couldn't see what it was that was so offensive to them. And for her, she explained something that was so powerful to me. I'll never, ever forget it. She said, you know, all the things that I used to judge in other women about being scantily clad and how there was no brain behind that and because she was an academic and all the other stuff that she thought was important in life were really masks for her own desire to be able to act like that, hmm. but not feel like she had the permission to act like that. So she judged it in others. And I thought it was one of the most poignant examples of exactly what we're talking about. We, each of us, are incapable of seeing the full 360 degrees because the knife can't cut itself, because the fire can't burn itself and the light can't light itself. Each of these things become so core for us to finally become aware of. And then when we finally become aware of it, then we resolve it. It's just simply through the awareness of it that it becomes resolved. So, you know, I, for a while, for about a year and a half, I was like trying to practice this to the best degree I could. And whenever I would want to feel the urge to judge someone as something that's separate from me, I would stop myself and say out loud, I am that I am. And people would be like, what the hell is he? Is like this guy got Tourette's or something? You know, is he like going to start swearing? He just talks to nobody. <laughs> and I'd be like, they like I, mess up your I coffee order. I am that <laughs> I am. That was my punishment to myself. You know, it's like, okay, you have to remind yourself that the thing that you want to judge in someone else, and it doesn't matter who it is. It could have been the president of the United States or someone running for president of the United States. And they were triggering me creating an annoyance within me. Then I had to stop myself and say, I am that I am. Were psychedelics helpful to that process? Yes. So psychedelics were powerful because for me, until that point in time, I was getting tons of downloads. I started publishing all my 
you know, geometric work and everything. I started putting it online and I was sharing it because I felt like part of my healing process was it's necessary to share with my U-inverse. That that's part of the acceptance, that there shall be no secrets between these two realms of myself, right? And transparency was a goal. So I just started posting it and the response that I got was like mind-blowing. I was just posting pictures of my notebooks, which then got published in several books now. And it was like artwork that was kind of geometric and mathematical as I was learning and deriving this language of the universe. I wasn't even intending it to be artwork, but people were like, oh, you need to publish these. This looks like artwork. This is, can I buy this? Can I? And I was like, mm. you know, they're really sacred to me. So I, I haven't sold any, but I've sold books that have all of it, you know, high gloss. And so it looks, looks just as good as the originals. But the, the thing is, is that I was getting to a point of DMT release just by drawing geometry for years. And I would get massive downloads and I'd be like, and they'd be hardcore physics and math, but that also had always spiritual depth and meaning. Because as I said earlier, you know, math without meaning, taught without meaning is just information, but math with meaning becomes divine communication. If we all learn math from the context of, wait, this is how God wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. When I say God, I don't mean some old man that's in a painting in the Sistine Chapel. If you look at the Sistine Chapel, which I was only there a few months ago, again, you'll notice that the thing that's surrounding God is actually brain. It's the shape of a brain. It looks like he's there with Sophia forming this X shape, and it's a brain shape. It's like a cross-section of a brain. You can see a very clear cerebellum, medulla oblongata. You can see all of it. And so what that's telling us is that it's sort of some sort of reflection from within. And finding that and unlocking that encryption of that hand of providence that's all throughout your life is like finding the cipher to your own existence. And what's better than finding the most important encryption of all, which is the self. So for me, it was like I started doing it all geometrically. And yes, you can get major psychedelic kind of experiences and downloads just by drawing geometry. It's the most powerful meditative practice that I've ever engaged in. It's a meditative practice. And I, I actually teach it as a meditative practice. But having said that, and I was always reticent because I grew up in Nebraska. I went to high school in Nebraska. You were in Missouri. And they scared the shit out of everybody. It's like, I remember the first time they taught about, you know, THC. It was like, oh my gosh. People at the Dairy in, Queen were going to smoke the pot. Pan. Yeah. It's like, this is your brain. This is, you know, this is a frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. And, you know, it was like this kind of crazy stuff. Whoever came up with that is the best marketer in the world. Oh, it was great. But it scared the piss out of people because it's like, oh, she smoked one joint and she died. She died from it. Like they just scared the bejesus out of everyone. So I'm like, whoa. And then I'd look at the people at Dairy Queen across the street in Nebraska in, in like, you know, this little town I grew up in after I moved from England of all places to Nebraska and people were there smoking joints. And I'm like, they're going to die. Oh my God, <laughs> they're going to die. And so more it, likely from the ice cream than the actual joint. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The ingredient list isn't even though I used to love exactly. dairy queen, but. So I looked at it and, and I was reticent to do any kind of, you know, people were like, Oh, do you want to do ayahuasca? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. It's like, well, what's it like? Well, you know, it's this whole ceremony and it's like a you know, long drawn out process. And then you, you barf and it's awesome. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> the sales pitch is. This is reminds strong. me of my first roller coaster ride, right? At, at, uh, in Missouri, which was at Kansas city. Yeah. Silver dollar worlds city. Of fun. Worlds of fun. Oh, worlds of fun. <laughs> yeah. I've been to worlds of fun. Six flags. Oh, classic. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to six flags too. So I was, I was like, this doesn't sound very fun. And then for some reason, mushrooms sounded more of a gateway for me because I'd done pot before. And I remember I got, <laughs> I have a funny story about pot. So I was working for Allergan. I, I got recruited by Warburg Pincus, a big private equity fund, to become CEO of Bausch & Lomb Surgical. It was this big thing, you know, it was like big news and everything in the industry. 
And I had left my job and everything. And then I get this, but I was going to take like a month off before I started the new job. And so, you know, my friends went out with me and they're like, oh, dude, let's go. Let's go. And I'm like, for the first time, I'm not working for anybody. You know, so this is like 2010. I'm free for like a month. I'm going to knock myself out, you know, let's smoke a joint type of thing. And so, of course, I have this Israeli friend who is like a freaking apothecary of everything drug related. And, and so he's like, oh, do this, do this. And so we smoke pot a few times. And then I get this email from this private equity fund saying, okay, so we're really excited for you to join the company and everything. Now, the first thing you have to do is go to get a drug test. The day after? <laughs> that was like a week after. That's divine intervention. So did you fail the drug test? No. So, um, and I was like, okay, so what do I do? Do I go fast? Because it was a hair test, right? Oh, so you either try to get on the front end of it or wait on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you have experience with this. Uh, once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> so, so I was shitting myself, like no joke. I was like freaked out. And because I they'd already announced it and everything. I'm like, wait, what? So I smoked a freaking two joints over two days or something. And and then I look up the statistics. They're like, okay, so the hair growth can find, you know, any trace element of THC. They can find it. Marijuana can be found in your hair, like for seven years. And I was like, oh my God, I was like totally mortified. This is so funny. And so I'm thinking, okay, so what could I do? And then this guy goes, he goes, well, you could like shave your whole body. <laughs> this like is so even classic. your even your eyebrows? Like even you your eyebrows, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, and then you have to say that you've got some sort of condition where you have like no hair. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Please tell me you shaved your whole body. No, I did it. I did not. Oh man. So I was like, okay, I, wish I just we gotta get on the photo front end of, this. of the oh. I gotta get up. But I was imagining myself like with shaved eyebrows, shaved head. You considered it? Everything. Oh, I for a moment. Yeah. For how for many a, moments? Like how long were you talking? Probably five minutes. Okay. That's so long. probably that's five pretty, minutes. It's pretty long. It's pretty long. <laughs> and so I'm like, this will be hilarious. So the better thing to do is instead to go sooner. That way I've at least got some time to try to like. Maybe I'll get, so I thought, here's what I'll do. I'll go get a test under, you know, I'll just do like a test that I don't submit to anyone just to see how I do on the test. And if I pass, then I'll do another test right at another location and that will be submitted for the company thing, right? And so that's what I did. And luckily, and it was both a urine test and the hair test. It was both. Oh my God. And I had a lot riding on this. Luckily, I passed. So it was it was fine. It was like by some divine intervention, it was fine. But so I've always been kind of traumatized to a certain extent, you know, first by junior high and high school, like this is your brain on drugs. And and then after that, I was like, okay, I've just learned my lesson, right? I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to do this anymore. So I got offered so many different, you know, journeys that I've always like, ah, oh, I'll pass, I'll pass. But with mushrooms, um, I felt like, okay, it's organic. It's natural. It's like, okay, naturally occurring substance. And LSD was also something that was kind of attractive to me because I was thinking, okay, well, Steve Jobs did it. That seemed to work out for him. <laughs> you know, visionary <laughs> guy, of, yeah, a lot of the right? I, I want to be a creative entrepreneur too. So I should do that as well, maybe. And, but I started, you know, I tried mushrooms and it was profound, it was profound because it revealed, it was nothing that I didn't already know. Um, it was a confirmation of what I already believed and knew. And I remember the first time I was like, whoa, I remember seeing this thing. I was, I was with someone and their whole face, everything was turned into like flower of life. And I could see the whole flower of life, but it was like golden. It was like a golden flower of life. You know, when you get to that stage of mushroom journey where everything is like this iridescent color, but it's got this golden aspect to it. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of after the early stage of it. And, and I saw this and it was like, there was holes all over the body of this person. I could see light coming in and out of it. And it was like really cool. And so then, then I see myself on this wall 
of, uh, it looked like an Indian style wall, right? It was like this Indian wall. And I'm standing on this wall, looking out from this kingdom to the outer lands of the kingdom. And then it's like zooming out, zooming out, zooming out. And so then I'm like zooming out to earth and then it zooms out to the solar system. Then it zooms out to the galaxy. Then it zooms out. And then all of a sudden it zooms all the way out from the galaxy. And then I notice there's this big, huge ball of dirt. And then it zooms out from that, and it's a speck of dirt in a giant's fingernail. <laughs> and I was like, wait, is that what we are? A speck of dirt in a giant's fingernail? Whoa. So was was the okay, was your takeaway from that visual specifically that like the whole universe is inside of us and like vice versa, mm -hmm. or that we are just like you said, you know, um, universe inverse however you describe you that inverse, yeah. you inverse um, it was as above so below that everything wow. was just a fractal of the same thing repeating in patterns over and over and over again and it was a profound thing and i kind of melted into it and you know the dose was large enough that it was like profound journey and also it was extremely heart opening and it was with someone that i you know really cared about as well and so it was, uh, it was powerful. And I remember coming off of that, just going, whoa, it was probably about 10 hours. And, and mm. I was like, I, that was crazy. And so you'll never get that experience again, which is like that first virgin type moment where it's so profoundly different. Now, now I do like some mushrooms and it's kind of like, Oh yeah, it's still heart opening. It's all those things, but I don't have the profoundness of the experience of it the first time. And I mean, there's there's a few different things I want to I want to ask you about as it relates to specifically mushrooms. Is, is mushrooms been your primary? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, and the nice thing about it, it's easy to travel everywhere with. And it's like, you know, I was in Mexico last week. It was pretty funny, <laughs> and I was in the back of a taxi, and police like pulled us over and. I was driving from Espita to Hobash, right, which is like this little island not far from Tulum, and um, and this cop was going to do a shakedown on us, right. So he takes my one of my bags that was in the back seat of the car. He's like, "Can I open this up?" So he's looking through everything. He takes out a pair of binoculars, you know, because of course I'm an explorer, right? I have all these things in there. Like I have a Geiger meter to re measure radiation. I've got a flute. I've got all kinds of stuff in there, right? A heart-shaped flute. Yeah, I feel like what's in your what's in your bag would be a viral TikTok. It it's hilarious. You know. It is really hilarious. I got crystals in there. I've got like, you know, malachite <laughs> crosses that I've gotten from Peru. You like know, this, I've got like this this conch polymath. flute that was given to me by the Toltec tribe that when they made me a shaman of the Toltec tribe, you know, the guardians of the, of the Teotihuacan Plateau. I mean, I've got all this crazy stuff in there. And he's like, looking through all of it. And, like, and then finally, he pulls out like this wrapper with like a golden wrapper of chocolate, right? And, and he's like, what's this? And I said, chocolate. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it just gives me, it's like, as soon as the chocolate, it's like, okay, take your chocolate and go. You know, you can leave now. And that was the pass out. I was like, how ironic is that, right? The one thing that was like probably contraband um, was just dismissed altogether. Um. So, so definitely mushrooms is, is great from that perspective because, and it's becoming more and more socially acceptable. It's being legalized all across the U.S. It's being legalized all across the U.S. And Colorado, I was just in Colorado, you know, this guy comes up to me. I was at dinner with my Gaia producer and he's like, hey, bro, I brought you some of this new, you know, mushroom stuff. It's called Enigma. And it's like, you know, like they look, literally look like the cross between pot and a mushroom, mm -hmm. but it's the shape of a brain. Like you need this because it's going to be like unbelievable and blow you away. You know, it's kind of like your your candle there, which is looking like penis envy. But mm -hmm. um, correct. The the thing is, is that it's so easy now. You know, everyone can. It's it's become so much easier. Um, I have also experienced now because of my friendship with certain people like Sherveen and others, right, and Adam Roa and and, and several others. You know, some of the other things like LSD and also uh, ketamine. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, ketamine is, you know, it's Kepsi, not Coke. That's kind of the joke. <laughs> so you eat it there. Yeah. And it's it's kind of interesting though, because I think ketamine, have you ever seen that movie Lucy? Yeah, I just watched it like three weeks ago, actually. Okay. You know the part where she's in the car driving with the French guy and she's got these like bands of frequency in front of her. And yeah. And she like goes like this, like we do on an iPhone to like mm-hmm. expand it. And it expands a band and then picks another band and then expands that. Mm-hmm. That's what ketamine does with time. Mm-hmm. I like that. It's very, it's very like interstellar. It is. Organic, it definitely yeah. warps your experience with time. Yeah. So you get, you're very much in the moment. And then when you have that along with mushrooms, um, I think that's a whole nother, you know, kind of experience. And in both cases, your ketamine doesn't last very long. So it's it's not like mushroom. Mushrooms are commitment. You're you're in it for depending on how much you take, you're in it for, you know, at least five hours. Do you microdose mushrooms? Um, I do, but not really. No, I mean it's like the only time I've ever microdosed is when I've been trying to discover something. No, noteworthy to to note that. Because, you know, one of the things I've done is we've discovered on the walls in the Great Pyramid um, many different petroglyphs along the walls. We actually turned it even into a game now called Maya. And I saw I saw a video, I don't know if you were on the trip with Paul Stamets, but he was talking about how they found, you know, paint, paintings of mushrooms essentially uh, inside the Great Pyramid. Were you, did you see this video or do you know what I'm talking about? No, I've not seen this. Um, so, and this is, you know, this is the whole work of Brian Morasco's book, The Mortality mm-hmm. Key, where he's talking about going over to, you know, it's basically the Lucinian mysteries, right? And the discovery of the fact that ergo infused barley is found at the bottom of all these ancient chalices that were used in ancient Greece and Rome mm-hmm. and proving that the original, um, you know, the origin of a lot of religion, including Christianity, oh, for sure. psychedelic sacrament was used as a part of it. For sure. And the history of it is super important. I know, I know you do a lot of these <clears throat> pilgrimages to, mm-hmm. to Egypt. So I'm curious if, if mushrooms were a part of those experiences for you or also had you helped you integrate them. You don't see mushroom as much. I'm sure they did though. Yeah. You don't see mushrooms as much. It's also not, it's a very dry, you know, climate there. Yeah. Um, maybe at one time there was more mushrooms. What they do talk a lot about is blue lotus. Mm-hmm. So blue lotus, you see a lot of, um, but yeah, I, I think the first time I tried mushrooms going into the Great Pyramid was a very microdose. And I wanted to see what I would experience in there. I'm now convinced that the Great Pyramid is intended to be used with mushrooms or blue lotus psychedelic. Why? Because there are so many things all over the walls that you can see so much more easily on these psychedelic substances. Hmm. So we've discovered now, and I presented it to the Egyptian government even on my last trip, that if you've seen Codex, my TV show on Gaia, right, we discovered on the north wall of the King's Chamber, a bull and a cow um, on the, in a diamond shape over the heart of the bull in the center of the cow. And then on the back wall uh, behind the sarcophagus, we had discovered uh, eye of Ra and also a lion and a king's face. Oh. And then on the south wall, we discovered snakes and DNA and everything in there. And then on the east wall, we discovered a woman riding a horse shooting a bow and arrow at an eagle. So we presented this um, and we put it into our game called Maya. We actually recreated the entire king's chamber from the original LIDAR scans. So it's a full virtual world. I'll show it to you. You can see it and play it even here in your house. It's epic. It's like going on a trip to Egypt. Next dinner party. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And the thing is, is that I presented this to an, an expert in astronomy and astrology um, in one of our math research meetings with Alan Green and, and several other people that have been on my research team for the last five years. And he was like, Robert, he's English. He goes, Robert, did you realize that like, all of these things match exactly in the position the Deccan symbols of astrology, which are 36 different symbologies of constellations. And those constellations make up the original 48 constellations of Ptolemy, which are the 12 that we know, the traditional 12, you know, Taurus, Leo, Sagittarius, uh, Virgo, all of those. And, and then for each one of those, they break down to a greater degree of specificity 
into 36, three for each one of the 12, uh, different constellations that represent aspects of greater specificity of each of those original 12 astrological symbologies that we have. I'd love to, I'd love to see it. I think, I think what's so cool. And the, and the point that I want to make is a lot of your, I, it's really unique that the way that your brain works, you actually didn't interact with any sort of psychedelic. Um, and actually Brian Morasco, who, who wrote the immortality key that it's like history of psychedelics. He's actually never taken psychedelics, which is cool. Cause he did a 12 year exploration and it kind of provides a different layer of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, like a lot of what's cool about this show and the intention of, of recording it is to bring people on the show, talk about their lives, the way that their brain works, um, their story, and then also show how psychedelics have been a part of that journey. Um, and there's so many, there's people that have been using them since they were, since they were yeah. teenagers or mm -hmm. come into them at different, from different angles. Um, and I actually didn't know even before we sat down mm -hmm. to record the show mm -hmm. that drawing sacred geometry can create that psychedelic DMT release oh, type state. without a question. Yeah. So I find that super interesting. I have a few other kind of, I mean, I've literally a list of like 20 questions that I didn't get to ask you. So we'll have to do a version two. Um, I watch your Ted talk, by the way, this is a plug for Robert's Ted talk. It's like a 10 year old mm -hmm. TEDx talk, but it's the one it's a few million views on, on mm -hmm. YouTube. Um, and it's amazing. And you had so many epic quotes in that Ted talk about death and the fear of death, making men immortal, which is, you know, it's, it's very aligned with everything that we're talking about. Um, and a lot of things that I've been thinking about lately. So highly recommend people watch that Ted talk. The last kind of direction I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you around to round out this conversation around psychedelics is really what do you feel is different about your brain? What do you feel is different about the way that you move through the world um, pre and and post engaging with, let's just say specifically mushrooms in this case? I think it's um, my brain is more open to my heart. So I think what mushrooms did, it was another aspect that was a critical aspect of opening my heart up to allow the brain to mm -hmm. play its role and opening my brain up to allow the heart to take the lead. And I think that is, uh, and also it taught me to be more open about my emotion. So it allows you somehow to just let this emotional aspect of you come out that might feel foreign to you in the beginning. And, but then it becomes with each time you, you use it, it becomes more and more natural to feel. And, and one of the things I think people misunderstand sometimes with my work is that they hear me say, Oh, we live in a simulation. We, I believe we do live in a simulation and I believe I can prove that mathematically and from a physics standpoint and i can put some very very strong arguments to make even the most ardent of materialist scientists really question right really question the nature of reality and and actually it's i'm in the winning side of this argument because the nobel prize which is a bunch of materialist scientists historically was just given in 2022 to you know, this, this proof that was done on quantum entanglement and that the universe is not locally real. That means it doesn't exist if you're not observing it. So literally that desk it doesn't exist if you're not observing it. That's right. You actually have a quote. I wrote this down. This was one of the first things I wrote down on your website that says the only real obstacles are the imaginary ones, mm -hmm. which I feel is, I don't know. The just, only true obstacles in life are the imaginary ones. And the, the most important thing, the only thing that's real in our universe is what we feel. So you could think about your perception playing this role. And I think where psychedelics takes us through this is that it allows us to see the world with different perspective, like geometry does. Geometry is a, is a means to being able to expand your awareness and consciousness to new realms that maybe before you had been closed off to. Whereas when you look at the world through psychedelics, it opens your heart. It's not just the seeing part. It really opens your heart. It allows you to feel those emotional states. And for people that want to become callous over the fact that we live in a simulation, because they say, well, if we live in a simulation, then why do I have to care about anything? 
It's all fake anyway, right? And I think if that's the conclusion we come to, then we've entirely missed the point. The point is to feel the emotion. It's to allow yourself to feel every emotion. You know, earlier today I was in a meeting and I said to somebody that, you know, in life you can skip rungs on the ladder of life, of experience. But eventually life has a way of bringing you back to every one of those rungs you missed. You have to touch everyone and you can't just ignore them. It's the same thing with all of our emotions. The emotions that we wanted to deny and not feel our way through will come back and haunt us. In this life or the next? In this life or the next. And so we have to clear it. And the only way to clear it is by feeling it and allowing it to wash Mm -hmm. through us, not to deny it, to acknowledge it and feel it. And I think what mushrooms does is it allows you to open up to a new degree of empathy, that that's the entire purpose. You know, this whole concept of learning how to love and how to be loved includes a massive aspect of it has to be the empathy. Mm. And empathy in this world today is is something that unfortunately, we all live in echo chambers of our own AI-driven conditioning bias. And so we think everyone agrees with us on everything. So then we're not practicing as a standard course of what the human species does. We're not practicing or exercising our muscle of empathy enough. What mushrooms does is it allows us to open into this new realm of empathic thought. And empathic thought is a critical aspect of enlightened experience. One of the things, I have a comment that I think kind of ties together a few points. I'm in this women's group right now, and the the prompt that we discussed yesterday was like, what is our definition of power? And so one of the things that I talked about was this intersection and like balance of the masculine and the feminine, which you kind of mentioned, this X that lives in our brain, mm-hmm. that Sistine Chapel painting, you know, is within. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the fact that we've been so conditioned as society, like even if someone someone looks at your resume, it's intimidating to look at or or to feel um when you go into a conversation, I remember like just growing up, especially the, just the way that I was raised intelligence was what was revered as power. And so a lot of times we speak from our head because we think that'll make us sound smart. And so that was like a total rewiring where now, even when I sit down to record this podcast, I'm like, speak from your heart, speak from your heart. That's like a lot of my mantra is like Mm -hmm. everything, you know, that, that wants to come through is with, is within you. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be, you know, always looking to gain more intelligence from this, like, you know, from mm-hmm. the, from the intellectual mind, but real power, like the people I know that are the most powerful, they speak from their heart. Um, and it's like power and empathy. You know, one of the things that Rick Doblin was just on our podcast yeah. and he, he talked about how we don't have a resource problem or intelligence problem in the world. Like that is not the issue. We have an empathy problem. And the, the more that we can, um, you know, really distribute that and then come more into our hearts through this work, that's that's real power. So it's cool to hear about your journey yeah. and how you've kind of landed here. If you had to share a message with someone that's listening to this to this show, mm-hmm. they, they maybe they gathered, um, you know, most of what you're saying. They can have a grasp on it and they want to learn more. What what do you hope that your work? What impact do you hope that it has in the next few years? Like, what is the goal? You shared what your mission is, but. Um, maybe just specifically in the lens of the show, what do you hope people kind of remember and take away? I think the thing that is most powerful that I hope people will take away from this is that you're perfect just as you are. There are no mistakes. And once we have that mindset shift to realize that our lives are not something that's just going to get wasted, every single experience is preset, predetermined. There's not a single thing left to chance, actually. What we call destiny is the free will of your higher self. And this is the path that you've chosen. So because there's no mistakes, then there's only learnings. So it takes the whole pressure off of everything. And I used to feel a lot of pressure for, I got to live up to my talents. I got to live up to my this. I've got to you know do this and accomplish that, and then I'll be good enough. And what I'm trying to say now is that you're perfect just as you are. We're on the precipice of a new age, a new age where we finally get to transition from human doing into human being. 
the mechanisms of society are now starting to reward beingness as much as it rewards doingness. And that transition is going to continue even more as all of us start to truly awaken to our true selves, our true nature, and why we're here, why we chose the duality experience. The duality is here for us to live through, to learn how to love, love it. And a lot of people get stuck thinking, you know, this earth existence kind of sucks. You know, it's like an escape room. We've got to get the hell out of this place. And some will even seek drugs or whatever to escape it. You know, I've never had an addictive type personality. Um, and I could be just fine without another psychedelic the rest of my life. It left me a gift. The gift is the expanded perception. Now, even if I'm not on mushrooms, I can still see the grid lines in the walls. Mm -hmm. I can still see the rainbows. I can still see your auras. I can still see all of these things. This is a gift that is permanent that I've learned how to tap into now. I don't need it all the time now. Um, and I didn't need it all the time before. But it was a gift that I think is opened up new synapses. You don't need any of it once you've experienced and you can at least... It's a reference point. It's a reference point. I think that's what Mushrooms does the most is it, it allowed me the ability to see something that was there all along. And by seeing it for the first time, it's like the hundredth monkey effect. You know, all of a sudden other people can see it too. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing I experienced with what happened in the Great Pyramid and how we discovered so many things on the walls and and that it's the decan of astrology it's pointing to the pyramid being a stargate and and it's evidentiary it's not up to you know interpretation now even for the egyptology community one of the things that i predicted in my show codex was that and you're the first to hear this because i'm the first podcast exclusive to information is just being about to be shared on codex um you know in the very first few episodes we said that the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci mm -hmm. was actually a map of the Great Pyramid and that each of the lines that he cut his man into, because he's got horizontal lines cut and vertical lines on the arms, at the shoulder, at the elbow, at the wrist, and the knees, and the chest, and the, you know, the groin area, etc. Each of these lines represents a different chamber inside the Great Pyramid when you know how to place it over the circle and square. Wow. And so from that... I predicted that the next chamber that they would discover in the Great Pyramid, because it already matched the groin line was the subterranean chamber. The, the ground level was, you know, the what we would call the sacral, you know. So this the 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 subterranean chamber is a root chakra. We've got the sacral chakra, which is the ground level, and then it goes up to the solar plexus. Solar plexus is the queen the queen's chamber in the Great Pyramid. And then you go to the heart chakra, which is the great you know, which is where the uh, the king's chamber is. And then there's three other lines. So that implies, since they were perfectly positioned in this way, that there are three other chambers inside the Great Pyramid. At least going up. And then there's ones at the knees as well, which would be deep, deep into the earth. And so I predicted on the show that the next chamber to be discovered would be at the throat chakra line. And it's the metathrone. Meta just means beyond. Metatron actually means a throne beyond. Which is what all geometric perfection is literally founded off of. Six point or 12 point perspective that you can literally find within this one structure of Metatron's cube, all geometric forms that exist in the universe. Wow. So it tells you something deep, right? And so they just announced this last week while I was at Gaia. I was having lunch with, uh, with the president. And I said, oh, you got to get prepared for if the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities announces that they found this new chamber exactly where I said it was going to be, that there would be a new grand gallery and that it would lead exactly to the throat chakra line, which is, which is what season one was about. And it just got announced this week that that's exactly what they found. Wow. In the exact correct position, right, in every way of looking at it from a dimensional standpoint, and so then it begs the question, what about the other lines? And what you realize is that the Great Pyramid is really just a reflection of the human journey. And every time we start to realize within ourselves the opening of these chakras, we'll start finding them inside the Great Pyramid as well. Wow. Right. That's wild. That's wild. But it's true. 
And this is the human journey is represented by Orion, Osiris, right? And now it's any wonder the night that we were in the Great Pyramid um, in December, and I hosted 50 people there. Um, on twelve twelve, it was the Orion portal. We didn't even plan that. It just happened to be. I didn't know it was Orion portal. And then it also happened to be that it was the first time in history that there was a asteroid that crossed in front of Betelgeuse that occluded it in an eclipse that day. So it was really amazing because we were there, you know, and experiencing this. And I was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. And then every time we went to a pyramid, there's another, we went to another pyramid and immediately standing on top of the pyramid in the sky was Orion constellation everywhere we went. And Orion is just a metaphor for humanity. And what's really fascinating about it is then just last, last week, um, Brian Cox, the famous physicist, as well as Michio Kaku, both came out publicly and said, hey, we think Betelgeuse is going to explode imminently into a, turn, into a supernova. It's 724 light years from us. That means that for it to explode in 2024, it actually exploded in 1300. Everything is perfectly timed. The past determines the future, and the future determines the past as much as vice versa is the case. What we consider time is some linear representation that is not linear at all. It goes both directions. We process through the equinox of the zodiac through the years. So we go from Aquarius to Pisces and Pisces to Aries and Aries to Taurus and Taurus to Gemini and Gemini to Cancer and Leo and so on. But in the precession of equinox, we go equally backwards through time. That's why we went from Pisces to Aquarius. Aquarius precedes Pisces, not the other way around. So we have a procession of time through the zodiac. We have a precession with it equally at the exact same time. Wow. And both are entangled one to another. So this aspect of who we are, what we are, is now on the precipice of dramatic shift. You know, Betelgeuse exploding, if it does explode, is, is again, another representation. You heard it here first. Yeah, and, and actually, you know how big it's going to be? If it explodes, it's going to literally be the size of our entire solar system. It'll look like a little rose in the sky, a red star explosion. And not only that, but the brightness of it is estimated to be identical to that of a full moon. So on a new moon night where it's dark, we won't have that darkness anymore after this explodes. The same thing with, with the daytime. You'll see it in the daytime. Like it'll be a bright, like as bright as a full moon. So it'll moon. change the way that we look at the sky. Yeah. So sometimes during the day you see the full moon, Yeah. right? You'll see this in the sky. So it's literally going to change and it represents this ascension of mankind. It represents mankind now coming to this heart brain awareness, to this Christ consciousness, the full opening of the throat chakra, the bridge connecting from the heart to the brain. And there is no separation between the two. We tend to look at math and physics and everything as being entirely separate from the arts. They're not. They're just different expressions. It's just like saying that the left brain anatomically is different than the right brain anatomically. Hmm. They look identical, but one side processes music, which is the arts, and and the other side processes number theory? Well, um, I, I hope people are, um, you know, the, the one takeaway, the, the, the main takeaway, there's so much that was just discussed on this episode. I could literally sit here and talk to you for hours and hours, but we got to let Luis go home, who's mm -hmm. filming this episode. Um, this has been so fascinating, and I hope that people are listening to it. Two two things. One is that you are you are perfectly designed. There are no mistakes. Everything within you um, is is perfectly designed by God. Um, secondly, that if you are looking to explore psychedelic states in a unique way, try drawing sacred geometry. So that's what mm. I um, I would love to if you to just share where is the best place for people to get more of you. And more of your information. I know on Instagram, mm -hmm. Robert Edward Grant is that the main place that people should interact uh, with you? You can go to my website, okay. robertedwardgrant.com. That's where I got all those great stats from. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also go to uh, my YouTube channel, which is also Robert Edward Grant. And on there, I have 30 classes okay. that are free of geometry that I taught during how to draw geometry. I did kind of a master's class during COVID. And that's when my work just kind of blew up. 
And so I, I have a course there called uh, Philosophical Geometry. Then I also have a course that's more structured uh, with like 10 courses on how to draw geometry called Meditative Geometry. Uh, I have another class curriculum called Etymology of Number, hmm. which shows the connection between math and everything. It's just the source code of all that exists. And, uh, and then I have one called Language of Light as well. Okay, and amazing. then I have books, Philomath and Polymath. Uh, are two books that I would recommend if you're on this journey. But the the great journey that this is, is just for you to find yourself, to find the hidden encryption of you. Find your zone of genius. That you are the hero you've always been looking for. It's not going to be found outside of you. All the answers are within. They're not outside. The last question we ask everyone on this show, given it is a show about psychedelics, you mm -hmm. normally would see our, our sign has just fell to the floor because it's floored by this conversation as well. <laughs> um, what is the most important lesson that psychedelics have taught you? To feel in profound ways that I didn't think were possible or at least that I was capable of feeling. And to go into that moment and experience the divine and this whole mycelial network, our connectivity to the earth, our connectivity to the whole universe, that it really is as above, so below, and as within, so without. We are here to experience this place and fall in love with it just as it is. Not to look at it with condition. You know, the way we transcend and we go to the next level of our evolution is by falling in love with where we are. It's no different than manifestation. People mm. that say, how do you manifest? Well, first thing you don't do is you don't create more separation between you and the thing you want to manifest. Mm. The best way to manifest is to feel as if you already have manifested it and truly feel into that. Once you have that experience that you've already felt like you manifested it, that's when it shows up all around you. The moment that you're like, oh, I need to get a loan from the bank. It's the moment you say the word need, then the loan becomes elusive to you. You have to put a ton of work into getting it. Hmm. It's impossibly hard. The only time to raise, the only, only time to get debt is when you don't need debt. Right? It's like go to a bank and try to get debt from a bank when you need the money. You can't do it. The time to get the debt is when you don't need it at all. And that's when banks are throwing it at you. And this is true with life. You want a relationship? If you feel like you already have a relationship with yourself and you're fully complete as you are, you will have you know, people coming at you wanting to start relationships with you, friendship or, or romantic. It doesn't matter. All the things that we perceive as scarce become inevitably scarce. And all the things that we perceive as abundant become inevitably abundant. It's if you think you can or you think you can't, you will be right. I hope if you're listening to this, you remember to fall in love with exactly where you are. That's that's a takeaway. I'm going to write that down many times because I love that. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is thank so you. amazing to get to know you more and inside your mind and hear your journey with mushrooms and just all of it. And now I want to go draw some sacred geometries. Maybe <laughs> I'll... Maybe that'll be some night nighttime uh, bed bedtime story for myself. Um, I'm excited to learn more about your work and to follow along the journey and to support in any way that I can. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Allie. Thanks for diving into the multiverse with us. If you're interested in being a featured guest on the show, sponsorship, partnership, or you're just mushroom curious, we're always looking to expand our mycelium network. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Into the Multiverse, where you can find clips from this podcast, psychedelic legalization news, events that we're doing, and so much more. We've also created our own in-house consumer lifestyle brand called Super Mush. We make mushroom mouth sprays. We make a whole line of mushroom streetwear. You can find it on Instagram at Super Mush or online at supermush.com. We'll see you next week. Much love.